just don't know what what really causes this phenomenon. So this has been going on for a very long time, but every time it happens, the scientists come up with a new required explanation. Welcome back, everybody. Tonight's guest is an award-winning author, podcaster, and unexpected paranormal investigator. She's a dear friend of mine and a member of Old Spirits Investigations as investigator and historian, along with being my partner in crime's wife and, more importantly, handler. <laughs> She's an all-around awesome person and a natural out in the field. Philippa Ballantyne, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. It's always nice to talk to another Phil. It is. Goodbye. It is. Yeah, we might have to get into that a little bit too, how that yeah, comes into yeah. play on our investigations. But uh, I don't know why it's taken so long to get you on the show here. I feel like your your husband's been been jumping in that spotlight. <laughs> <laughs> well, I feel like I was I was like a little bit behind him as well, just yeah. getting into this kind of thing. Yep, yep um, absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. Let's go back. Let's let's time travel a little bit. Do you have any early history with the paranormal or the unexplained? Any any events happened before you started getting involved with us? Well, I, I I've been thinking about that. You know, various various times. My my natural inclination is always to be a huge skeptic. My dad yes. is mm. a, a very um, knowledgeable scientific minded kind of uh, guy and I guess I probably inherited that from him of course uh however there have been um one of my earliest memories was when I was about five and my dad moved us down to the city called Christchurch uh, in New Zealand where he went to study um, electrical engineering and I was about five or six when I was down there and we did move into this glorious old Victorian house that I just adored and it was a house full of locked doors because we were renting it. I see. And, and so there were all these sort of uh, areas that uh, I was not allowed to go and I would peer through keyholes and I would imagine things. And I've seen that movie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and so that, that always made me, I guess there's always been this scientific side from my dad and then there've been this other, I, I would Call it Celtic side because okay. um, the other side of his family is full Scots and there's a lot of that sort of, um, you know, attraction to the natural world yeah. and mm -hmm. ghost stories and stuff like that. However, my grandmother on my mother's side was also hugely superstitious, okay. massively superstitious. And um, I, I thought they were adorable little habits. Yes. But she would do, when, like when my grandfather died, all the clocks had to be stopped, all the mirrors had to be covered, all of that sort of thing. And there, were, there was always a weird vibe in her house that there were some rooms I just didn't like to go into. Yep. There was a dark corridor that I didn't like to go up alone, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, so I guess that was kind of always there. And, you know, as a, as a writer... You always imagine magic. Of course. I, I remember distinctly when I was um, probably in my teens and I was just starting to write and I thought to myself, there is no magic in the world. And I was so deeply disappointed and cut by that. Yeah. But now that we're doing all of this sort of stuff, I'm like, mm, I think I was wrong. Uh, yeah. You know what? And that's interesting, right? Because it sounds like up until we all start doing this together, your philosophy aired much more on the analytical side that, you know, if there's corresponding data, then it's validated and it's real. If there's gaps in this information, then I'm leaning toward the I'm not a believer side, right? Mm. Does that make sense? It does. I, I will say that there was one event that kind of softened me up to thinking about these sort of things was about Five years ago, I flew back to New Zealand because mm -hmm. my dad was having a quadruple bypass. And things had not gone well, and they'd done that little bit where they take you into the room, the little room, which is always bad. Yeah. And they were basically like, okay, you've got to go home now. He's in ICU. We've done all we can. If, we, if something happens, we will call you in the night. So 
we all went back. We're all kind of shell shocked. I yeah. went and slept in my grandmother's old bed. She had passed many years ago, but it was the bed that she slept in. And I went to sleep and I had this very vivid dream of my dad lying in ICU mm-hmm. and he was surrounded by my uh, his father, my grandfather, um, my nana, who was my mother's mother, but still very much loved my dad, and my great aunt Ruth. And they were sort of standing all around him and there was a, a sort of a continuous circle of light traveling between the three of them. And they just said, we got this. He's, he's, he's not ready to go yet. And then I woke up and I was like, had the smell of um, lavender in my nostrils, okay. which I always associated with my Nana. And, um, and I, I sort of realized, oh, they didn't call. Things are looking up. And he recovered from that, which was kind of incredible. He was 11 hours on a heart lung machine. So, wow. Yeah. No. So, at that time, did you attribute that dream to something more than just your, you know, your subconscious firing very actively with all the stress and hoping for a positive outcome? Or did you scratch your head a little bit? Um, I would say that when my, my Nana passed away, I remember the two days before she died, she said, I've seen my mother. Mm -hmm. Um, she's in the room with me, that sort of thing. And so perhaps subconsciously I was thinking of that. Also, when I went to sleep, I I remember thinking, like opening myself and saying, I wish I could hear from somebody. Right. Like, Mm -hmm. I wish I could have something, some knowledge of what's going to be, is it going to be okay kind of thing. Right. And if it's not going to be okay that he's going to be taken, welcomed by people who love him. So... Yeah, I, I think it was a weirdly um, instinctual thing. That's that's interesting. And we'll, we'll get more into the dream aspect because mm. I do want to chat a little bit about that. So that was about five years ago. And then mm-hmm. you're trucking along life as usual and living your life as a award-winning author, <laughs> keeping track of tea, you know. <laughs> Full-time job. <laughs> and, then, and then tea says to you in some way, shape, or form, hey, Bill and I are going to try to go out and do an actual paranormal investigation. Mm-hmm. What was your What was your initial reaction? To uh, I think my initial reaction is, oh, that's nice. I'm going to go do something with his buddy. Right. Oh, that'll get yeah. him out of the house and he'll have something <laughs> fun to do. And, you know, not really thinking anything, but hey, they'll go have a good time, go somewhere different, you know. Makes sense. <laughs> and then but then we kept we kept doing it mm-hmm. and we shared evidence with you and so at the point where teeny is coming back and you guys haven't gone out yet to do to head up to gettysburg we'll just say mm. to head up to gettysburg uh and t is playing you some of the stuff that he's found some of the stuff that i've found mm-hmm. for you what's because I know he's processing this as a skeptic, but yeah. also having a hard time kind of um, being able to rationalize the things that he's bringing back. Mm-hmm. And where, as a sort of this outsider at this stage, how was your processing? What was that like to see him kind of shifting a bit? I know he's still the skeptic, right? He's still he's still my scully. But just to see him trying to figure out what the hell is going on with these investigations what was going on for you? Um, I think I was like, okay, that's that. There is something strange there, but I'm sure there's some sort of explanation for that. I mean, I, I guess I was probably thinking, well, the human mind wants to believe. We 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 are molders. We want to believe yes. something. And so I'm like, okay, so he's found some odd things. That is strange. That is strange. I'll give you that. But I'm not convinced that that's anything other than just coincidence or your mind trying to justify and align itself, you know, in yeah. a, in a magical way. Right. I mean, I want to believe in magic too, but maybe, the, you know, maybe you just, you know, I think when it becomes personal, that's, <laughs> that's when you start to go, okay, now I really. Yes. <laughs> and, and there was a certain pivotal moment that kept you up for several <laughs> nights. And I would love for you to share that with the listeners because this is um, one of my my favorite you know 
my favorite vicarious moments. Yeah, because so because you guys have been going out to these cool historical places and I love I'm a huge history nerd. I love history. Um, I was like, oh, you know what? I want to go to Gettysburg. I want to wander around and see this place. And not really thinking too much about capturing anything paranormal. I just want to go and soak in the history and see what this place is. One of my cousins is a huge uh, American Civil War buff, weirdly, in in New Zealand. (laughs) And so I was like, hey, maybe if I go there, I'll take some pictures and send them some pictures and stuff like that. So we just book a hotel and we go and we wander around a little bit. And then T, we decide to go out at twilight. And I'm not entirely sure why we decided to do that. I, I mean, I know from Celtic lore, twilight is the when the the veil is the thinnest, right? As of course, you would say that sort lim- of liminal space, right? Liminal space, liminal time, and um, so I was like, oh, but oh, the light is also very nice for photography. Yeah. Mm-hmm. the golden hour. Yes. So I was like, okay, let's. Um, T's like, oh, should I bring my um, my H4, his recorder? And I was like, oh, yeah, sure. Just bring it. Why not? Why not? Why not? And so we did basically a full – we parked in the parking lot. We walked all the way out to the Pennsylvania Monument, I think it is, the big one at the end. Yep. And then we're walking back, and it's August. We're kind of tired, a little grumpy with each other because we're like, well, why do we park there? And But as we're walking back, T's talking into the H4. And we get to this monument that is right next to the parking lot, and it's to the wards, the Army of the Potomac. T says, um, is there anybody here with us? And then I just turn and look at the monument, and I just say, oh, is there anybody here from the Army of the Potomac? We don't hear anything. Uh, we get back. T's just listening to the audio, and then the next thing I know, he's like, pip, 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 get in here, get in here, get in here. And I'm like, okay, whatever. And this is on the spot. This is... Yeah, no, 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 this is when we get home. Okay. All we, right. were, we were down in the office and uh, he's like, you got to listen to this. And he turns it on and you hear him ask and you hear me ask my question. And then you hear this voice that is so clear saying, I'm here. And it's a light voice, could be a young man. And I'm like, and you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to play that clip for everybody. Yeah. So we're about to leave. If you want to say anything, now would be a good time. If you are here, give us a sign. Speak with us, please. Anyone from the Army of the Potomac? So for my um, listeners out there that are skeptical that have just listened to that, that's a tough one to pan off as something else. And they were you were on your own. There weren't a lot of people around you, correct? There was, at that time. Everybody else had packed up. We were the like the last people there. There was no I, there was nobody around in the area. I've had um uh so many people listen to that clip and they say Okay, even this, even the skeptical ones, like we went to a writing retreat, I played it to all of them. Even the skeptical ones are like, okay, I, what? One person said it's birds. I was like, really? Would birds say that? What is there? A parrot? A parrot. It lives, pe- <laughs> lives in Pennsylvania. <laughs> uh, I had somebody else say, well, sound travels, it bounces. But then I also, um, uh, Steve Saylor, who is a friend of the show, taken yes. on, uh, he has uh, quite a, and sense of knowledge of audio because he yep. worked in the radio industry. And he said, no, that the quality of sound, I can tell that that's right next to you. Yeah. Yes, exactly. There are certain, there are certain characteristics for any given sound based on its distance from a microphone. And when you've done enough audio, you get a sense, you get some sense of how close that source is to the microphone or whatever's receiving. Right. And yeah, that was, I mean, right up, right up there, right yeah. by your <laughs> And it was it was life changing as well because I, I, you know, we listened to it again and again, and I, I'm I'm just like, what what is happening? <laughs> <laughs> and I I lay awake at night, like thinking about like how trying to contort myself into 
finding some explanation for that, how that happened. Who was there was definitely no I when it's you know, you can listen to stuff that other people have recorded and you go, oh well, you know, that was a creaky door or whatever. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But when you actually have a personal experience of your own, you know the the circumstances that it was that it happened in. Right. You knew the environment. I uh, yeah. On. I mean it's and the thing is about that particular voice that you captured, it does seem to be in direct response to what you're asking. Mm-hmm. Is there anyone here from the Army of the Potomac? Yeah. And I just got the chills again thinking about <laughs> that. I mean, I think each time you guys have played that for me, it it gives me the chills. Yeah, it's it's got a, it's got like a sad kind of like a lonely yeah, yeah tone to it as well. Like, hey, I'm I'm here. I'm, I'm here, but where's everybody <laughs> where's everybody else? You know? Yeah, yeah. So that was like, okay, all right, I need to I need to get into this a little bit, a little bit more. Um, I was, I was talking to a a friend of mine who is very much into um, the paranormal, the spiritual, that sort of of thing. And uh, I talked about what we were doing and things and she was not, I was a bit worried that she was going to be freaked out. Like, okay, you're opening yourself up. Right. But we, we talked through things and then she was like, you know, she said, maybe, you're just you just attract those things because of your heritage and the fact that you're a mom, yeah, you know, a caring person, that these voices, these people are just attracted to that. Which I didn't find I was like, okay, that doesn't sound scary. No, it doesn't sound scary at all. And I think no. that's kind of a crossing over point for a lot of people. At least it was for me before I started really getting into not even just the investigative side, but uh, when I started doing Don't Turn Around, it really opened my eyes in a lot of, in a lot of ways where a lot of this had been scary. Mm. But the more we do it, I mean, let's, let's face it, we have had some frightening moments. <laughs> we have had some frightening moments, but overall, big picture, it's much more exciting and fascinating than it is terrifying. Mm. I think the fact that when you when you ask a question and you get an answer, that's like okay. Because I I guess part of me was like at the beginning when T was talking about it. Well, I was like I, I kind of like the idea of energy, yeah. And so that if someone experiences you know joy in a place or pain in a place, in my scientifically side brain, I'm like I could kind of see maybe quantum physics. There's yes, something we yeah. don't understand. Something is being imprinted in an area. Right. And that I was like, okay, yeah, that seems fine. But when you have something that <laughs> answers you, you're like, okay, so that's not a residual kind of thing. Yeah. That's and, that's something that's there. And there are times where you capture a voice and you think, okay, it could be a direct response. And we mm. have many more of those than the that's absolutely a direct response. And I'm thinking of the one that I sent you last night yes. and those direct responses, no matter what are just very, they they're chilling. Not, yeah. Not bad, but last night I was just so wired and just kind of off. And again, trying to rationalize that mm-hmm. as okay, it could have been something else or tea out in the hall, but um, I don't think so. <laughs> and it was funny because when I listened to it, uh, before I had gotten the name from you, uh, or from T via you while we were streaming last night, I was trying very hard to pigeonhole it into the name Edward, but it just yeah. didn't have that finish to it. I'm like, is Ed something, but you mm-hmm. know, I thought the kid's name was Edward. And then when T told me it was Edwin, I said, okay, let me listen to this again. And that's a hundred percent what I hear. I don't mm-hmm. know about, I don't know about, about your take on it, but, uh, Again, those moments of where you can confirm to a reasonable degree that you've received a direct response, I mean, that sets off all other kind of mm. thoughts in, in your well, mind. Well, getting back to that Cemetery Ridge thing, that really set me on a, off on a historical, like, I must find out who died here. Yes, yes, of um, course. So I got myself a book because uh, there's a spe- it's pretty well known what happened at Cemetery Ridge at various mm-hmm. times. 
Um, but we went back that second time and I got this, I said, I, I would really like to know your name so I can, you know, find out about, you know, who I'm talking to. And the voice was not as strong as the I'm here one, but it was, my name is, and it was two syllables. And now I yeah. thought it was Brandon. Mm -hmm. And so I got the book of, uh, I know that it was July 3rd that the assault on Cemetery Ridge happened, Pickett's Charge and all of that. Um, so, and, and you know the spot because we've right. been there. Yeah. And uh, so I was looking at the uh, people who were in the Army of the Potomac who died on that day in that spot. And that's when I found a Myron <clears throat> who was a young man from Vermont who's, um, I think he was only 19 or 20, very young yeah. man. Uh, and I found out a whole bunch of stuff about him, like his and his family, at least, you know, descendants, although he had no kids, but of his, of his brothers and sisters still go there. And so when I was playing it again, I was like, is that, could that be my Ron rather than Brandon? Yeah. It's, you know, so we're going to go back to Gettysburg and I got to do some more conversations. Yeah, well, <laughs> and that's the thing that that's, makes the follow up visits exciting mm. too, because you have that focus, right? You, you know what answers you're hoping to mm. find. And so it, it's, yeah, man, it is just so wild. Yes. I, and are you actually there with me that second time I was yes. there? And that was when I had, because there's been some things that I'm just like, what was that? How does that happen? And I know you have a lot of um, like what you would call personal experiences, yes. smells, yeah. feelings, mm -hmm. someone touching, whatever. And I'd never really had that. But we were standing there, what was it, February or March? It was freezing it was, cold. It was, I believe it was February. It was cold. Yeah, It was, it was freezing cold. cold and I just, when I was standing in that spot, I had the sensation that every time I breathed it in, it was like hot all the yeah. way down. Yeah. And it yeah, was, that was so strange. Very strange. It was so strange. And when I walked away, it was gone. And, and, I, and at that time, we caught a voice as well. One, I'm, I don't think you heard it, but I did mm. hear it of... A uh, sounded like a young boy saying, "Mom," because you were. Yeah. I think you were asking, "Do you miss your I mother?" Was, I was talking about the mom. Yeah, it yeah. was. There was some interesting stuff that was coming up on on Ghost Tube, like you know, I, I I'm hiding and all of that sort of stuff because it was just that's a very emotional space. It I really think. is. You know, yeah. there was a lot going on there, and I found out poor poor Myron was killed. Um, by cannon fire, like early, early on July third, like it would have been just quick, because um, yeah. they actually described how he died, which was, you know, <laughs> I was like, I'm getting emotional about yeah. a person who's been dead for like but so isn't long. It, isn't that interesting? That connection you feel when you have an maybe an idea of who the spirit might be, or just even the souls that had inhabited that place and you start learning more about them, you do develop a real, mm. a real connection. I actually I've, I've... have a, I actually have a picture of Myron. Oh, really? Yes. Do you want to hold it up since we're, uh, this is video? <laughs> I will send it to <laughs> uh, okay, you. Send you can it. put it in there. We'll put it in the show notes. Cause he wrote a journal. And so, you know, there's, um, it got preserved somewhere up in uh, Vermont, which is kind of why I want to uh, go to Vermont. <laughs> and so do you know, just offhand, kind of a side, question here when he joined the army of the potomac was he with them uh, from the start of the the war i can i can i don't know offhand but i do know that there was an event where they were doing uh signups and he mm -hmm. went off and apparently his rest of his family did not know oh wow. he went to this event and signed up and he was the youngest son um so wow. they were pretty pretty uh, upset about that um so yeah i can kind of trace his journey if if, uh... <laughs> so the reason the reason I ask, and mm. this is would place this two years before that battle where he lost his life, but as you know, Ball's Bluff is one of my favorite spots, uh... and the Army of the Potomac was involved in that battle. So I'd be curious be interesting. if he was yeah. there. Wouldn't that be wild? And it didn't. I didn't make the connection mm. until T and I went back out the other week. Or no, it was before, it was when I went out al alone. And mm. then that night I made the connection that, wait a minute, Army of the Potomac. 
They were here. Hang on a second. They were here, and and then it got me to thinking. So I'm. I'll have to curious. look into that. I'll have to look into that. He was. Um, yeah, it, it is funny to be just connected with those, and and all around the area that we both live in, there's so many places that they could have touched. Um, you know the the, yeah. the Louisiana Tigers that were fighting like five minutes down the road from me yeah. ended up in Gettysburg as well, and uh, yeah, it's just it's it's remarkable. And we've had some, <laughs> and we've had some experience with the uh, Louisiana Tigers, right? You want to share That's a little right. bit about some of our uh, our <laughs> our local battlefield adventures? Oh yes, Bristow Run um, was a battle between the Union and the Confederates for control of the railway line that goes from DC down through Virginia. Um, but also, there was a large encampment down there of Confederates beforehand, and a lot of them died of, um, you know cholera that sort of thing they yeah. got sick but there were also there was also a battle down there uh and we went down that that we were also there at a liminal time we were yep. also there at about uh, oops oopsie. <laughs> um and we were in the space there was a creek and the louisiana tigers who are just i've been reading about them are the most uh drunken obs- you know just People would run away. The, their own side would run away from the Louisiana Tigers because apparently they would, <laughs> they were just drunk all the time, always getting in fights. They were, yeah. Um, so when we were down there, they were all made up of sort of basically immigrants. So some of them would have been Irish, some of them would have been Creole, um, some of them would have been French. You know, all sorts of different people in that uh, unit. And. Uh, when we were asked, I was trying out my schoolgirl French down there, <laughs> and I was like, "Did you die here in French?" And then he just went, "No." And it's crystal clear. Yeah, uh, it, it's you can hear the differentiation between "no" and "non," and it's non. it's absolutely a curt <laughs> French response nope. right there. Very French, no. <laughs> yeah, and there was nothing there at the time that would have made a sound similar to that, and no. we sure as heck. Unless there's any French, you know, like foxes or it's I that, don't know. It's that parrot that followed you all the way from uh, oh, God damn <laughs> from Gettysburg and it's multilingual. God damn parrot. Right. It's 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 interesting to me the the reactions that I always think there's different people get different reactions out of a out of a spot. Yeah. Um I I don't think I would go with U and T to a uh prison or an asa- a former asylum because okay. I just, I just feel I wouldn't enjoy the atmosphere of pain and sorrow and all of that sort of thing. Yeah, However, I, I love battlefields. So. Yeah, but you, I mean, you, and but you are, in my experience, being out there with you, are mm-hmm. very receptive to these. We'll see these emotions that are locked in time or whatnot. Uh, I remember one of our first times in Gettysburg together. Uh, we were in the grove, and I think you became very overcome mm. with emotion. Yeah, there's been several times where I've been like, I want to cry. Yeah. Um, that happened at Tuckahoe as well. Yeah, both you and I uh, yeah. at the same time, both Phil's. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like we have a Phil connection. Uh, yeah, we absolutely. were, uh, we were um, I, I guess the other, there are some start times that really stood out to me uh, on battlefields, but the one in Manassas Battlefield is not here not very far from here either and i'm itching to go back because we went i think it was late march yeah like er, very early spring and i had that was the oddest one that i'm still trying to you know figure out what happened with that when we were all walking down the hill there was nobody else around us we're walking down the hill i was at the back and i had this really strong feeling like someone was walking behind us like a person was walking behind us so i fully expected to turn around and let somebody have it like what are you following us for what are you you?" and there was (laughs) nobody there and i I, there's a recording of me giving giving like nervous sort of (laughs) laugh (laughs) and going oh well that was stupid i don't know what i was thinking and then when we go back and listen to the audio uh, there's again a very light, high pitched, like, hey, yeah, I'm here. And then yeah. it repeats itself, hey, I'm here. 
And I've had some interesting, I've played that to a few different people. Um, Spence suggested it might be an elemental. Mm-hmm. Um, and my friend that I was, was talking about earlier, she said, maybe that wasn't something that was attached to that place. Maybe that's someone who's watching over you. Right. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And then that's... that sort of liminal space was able to say, hey, I'm, just so you know, I'm here. I'm right here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't, it didn't sound like Aunt Ruth, but you know, she was a young girl once. So I don't know. Yeah. yeah. There's so many possibilities. Mm, mm. And to me, that's one of the most exciting things about being involved in this field now is just letting your mind go mm. and contemplate these vast ideas. It's it's humbling. You know, it's awe-inspiring. Sometimes it's a little unsettling, but it's it's all... <laughs> you know, that's part of... I, I, I do think about that 16-year-old me going, there's no magic, and I'm like, just you wait. <laughs> yeah, just hang just on. you wait. Yeah. Just hang on. Hang on. Um, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was, mm-hmm. I was just going to talk about Ruth because we were talking about Ruth. <laughs> let's talk about, uh, yeah, let's, this is a good segue. Let's talk about your, your great aunt, Ruth. Yes. Um, so uh, she, <laughs> she, what? I just had another thought, but I'll wait till you're done talking <laughs> about aunt Ruth. Okay. Um, so my aunt Ruth was my dad's aunt. My uh, grandmother passed away very young and I was, well, I think I was only six or so. So her sister, Ruth, took over the kind of the matriarchal deal. She yeah. mm-hmm. organized everything. She was great with the grandkids, all of that. Um, she and I had a, quite a special connection because she helped me with, uh, I, I sewed my own prom dress and she helped me. I went and stayed with her for a week. And oh, she was just the nicest, yeah. kindest, wonderful human being you could ever imagine. And so... The whole thing with my father and, and the circle of light and her there, I, I, that was like, that makes sense. Um, I want to say that the idea of her being around me kind of cropped up when T and I were in uh, North Carolina. Mm-hmm. We were staying in an old bed and breakfast that had been uh, an old building in yeah. uh, Wilmington. And the lady there was just so sweet. And she was like, oh, well, you're interested in haunted stuff? Well, <laughs> Our place is haunted. You can investigate. Now, T and I had not planned on doing any investigation. This is a writing retreat. Of course. So we didn't have any of the usual things that we do to kind of cleanse the energy and, right. and uh, make sure nothing's attached. Um, but T was like, oh, yeah, yeah, we'll do that. So he said, oh, we'll get up at 1 o'clock on the last night they're staying and we'll do a bit of investigation. So we went to sleep. And as we're asleep, I'm having a dream again. Of course. And in this dream, Aunt Ruth is there. And she says, Philippa, I want you to know that you, you know, don't open doors you can't close. And not everything that smiles is nice. Just remember that. And so I, when the alarm went off at one, I woke up and I said to T, oh, we can't. We can't investigate. And he's like, why? I'm like, we, we don't have anything to shut any doors. And I told him the, yeah. the story yeah. about Ruth. And then I don't even know if I remember I had it. After that, I came back and I found that I had a brooch. When she passed away, she left me this little brooch of hers. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I just found it tucked away. And I was like, oh, okay, I remember now I have that. So now that's part of our uh, little close close the door situation with Ruth. Yeah, which is a very important part of our... Mm. It has become a very important part of our investigative routine because we always cleanse when we're done. And this just added layer of closing the door, I think, Mm -hmm. makes everyone at the end of the investigation just feel calm Mm. and and okay about leaving that nothing is going to be hopping in the backseat. We (laughs) don't like that. The other, when when we were at uh, at one event, I came back and I had another dream. This was just a weird dream where I was filming a music video with David Bowie, as I usually (laughs) dream about. But this was just after we'd done an investigation. And I was having this dream, and then suddenly this figure, this black figure that I could only see, like, the legs of and, like, a cloak, stepped out out of the darkness into the light to stand in front of me. And I, there was this loud voice that screamed, no. And I woke up bolt upright. And I was like, 
maybe the door wasn't completely closed. Maybe not. So maybe, maybe I, I sat, opened door. the window and I saged the house completely yeah. and it felt much better. And I was like, is that Ruth saying, hey, hey, <laughs> so do something. A thought occurred to me that <laughs> that didn't occur to me when you sent me the audio originally from our preliminary investigation at um, at the candy factory. Mm-hmm. When both Ghost Tube and uh, oh. the Spirit Box both said "aunt," which is "aunt," right? Yes. <laughs> aunt. So, so maybe, um, maybe Aunt Ruth was that is true. Speaking yes, up. yes, because we got it. I got it once on Ghost Tube, and then it came through twice on the Spirit Box. Yeah, which is it's comforting in- thought. Very interesting. Yeah. So <laughs> keep that in mind. Keep that in mind, and and. Always keep track of that brooch because yes, we yes, cannot I afford to be without that. <laughs> no, no. I I thought I'd lost it once and so I put it in the wrong pocket and I was like, oh, well, I guess we yeah. can't go anywhere. <laughs> yeah, I think we were there for that. I think we were there for that. <laughs> so what, what have been some of your favorite spots that we've all been to? Uh, there's so many good ones. I mean, I I love Gettysburg and Jenny Wade House is just – a lot of it stuff is. going on there. We had that wonderful, um, we had a wonderful Estes method with Steve there. But before that, we had the one where uh, it seemed like we were talking to, I can't remember, James? Yes. Was yes. it James? Yes. The father? The father. Yeah. And, and and it got heard on stream and that sort of thing. I mean, who doesn't love a disembodied voice? No. Those um, are always. But I feel like. <laughs> <laughs> those are always like what when you it? hear when you hear the voice and no one says that was me yeah that's when you go but <laughs> I, I don't know i'm also kind of enjoying linville manor um yes. the the two things if the twice that we've been there have been two just not just the spirit box or or uh ghost tube or anything going off because those all happen the REM pod mm-hmm. you know all of that but the two experiences we had with the first time when you were wandering around setting up and we were all just chatting away and then suddenly, Mom! Yeah. <laughs> and we, everybody just was like, what, what, what's going yeah. on? Yeah. No, that wasn't me. What, what? Yeah, so and, we heard a disembodied voice that said Mom. Yeah. And the girls initially thought it was uh, Serena and then she said, well, no, 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 it wasn't me. And friends, it wasn't me, Piper, but it wasn't me. <laughs> Everyone's and like, fact, oh! And, and I believe we caught it too, didn't we? Yes, catch it we on have, the recording. We, absolutely, we caught it on the recording. It's it's very loud. Um, so that that was really cool. And then the last time we were, we unfortunately you weren't in the room. Um, I had cupcake was, business to take. You care had of, cupcake which is business. Very important. <laughs> but there were like uh, well, there were about six or six of us in yeah. the room at the same time while you and uh, Tina were out sorting out the cupcakes, and we're just standing around just in the dark talking, you know, la, 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 la. and then suddenly this, like a, like somebody turned on a um, LED light just for a split second. And it was above our head, about two feet from the ceiling. And it's just funny to me how the brain is trying to like, oh, someone must have flicked on a light above right. our head. Right. I look mm-hmm. up, there is no light fitting there. Nope. And I say, did you see that? And everybody's like, what was that? Everybody saw it. Yeah. yeah. Well, we even heard you react <laughs> from the kitchen. Yeah. It was, it was, again, Linville has one like super crazy thing that just yeah. happens. That place is, is really, really special. And my listeners are familiar with when he's been on oh, the yes. show. I'm going to have him fantastic. on again. He is a, uh, just a, a special, awesome guy. Interestingly, when I when I had Ghost Tube on and Win was nearby, Guide kept coming up. Like, oh, yeah. you know that they knew Win had saved the house, basically. Yeah, which is interesting because we haven't had. I don't think we've heard it say Guide much no. anywhere else. No, there's some. I mean, I enjoy Ghost Tube, but when it ha- when it does repeated things, like when we were at uh, the uh, Union Fort in Manassas. Um, I had injured my leg that one time and I was walking around with a cane and three times ghost tube went off saying, sit down. And then other times we've gone there, never says that. (laughs) And it's interesting. I, 
when it comes to apps, I'm always mm. highly, highly skeptical. But time and again, Ghost Tube has come through and has been giving responses that have been extremely relevant, mm. right? Yeah. And to have it have it say aunt before the spirit box. Said, yeah. And that alignment there really gave me pause and it had me wondering, is mm. it the is it the app? Okay, we're gonna get a little woo here now. All right. <laughs> okay. Pip, is it the app or is it you know, with the intention that we're putting into it, the energy that we're putting into whatever this device is, if it's an app, mm -hmm. if it's a REM pod, if it's a K2, if it's a spirit box, is it our intention that is essentially creating this channel via mm -hmm. whatever this tool is? I've come to believe that intention is everything. Mm -hmm. It's super important. Like um, if you go in, like, if you go into a place with bad energy and bad intentions, you're going to get that reflected back, mm -hmm. back at you. So I, I really enjoy the fact that OSI does respectful, you know, investigations, treat, you know, whatever energies are around you with the same respect that you would hopefully yeah. treat people. Yeah. And I think that that's when you, when you get the good stuff is when they're like, oh, you want to know about us or me or whatever um and i think also when you have the intention of okay i'm not you have to stay here yeah. i'm leaving that's also a very powerful mm -hmm. intention as well so i think that the idea that the tools that you're using are affected by your intention your energy i think that's pretty interesting one yeah yeah i have come to subscribe to that philosophy as we've been doing this more and more and just what I get from different devices and some devices start to give me more over time. I've noticed mm -hmm. as well. I think the REM pod is a perfect example. When I first got it, it didn't really do too much. Even at TWA, uh, it really started to shine at Crescent only once, only once, but man, it was quite the light show. And then since then we've been having some, I wouldn't say, you know, frequent, uh, hits on it, but much yeah. more like dramatic moments with the REM pod. So I just got to think that part of it is this connection that we foster with the tools that we're using. Yeah. You know, I, I, in one sense, yes, I see them as, as response devices, as, as devices to give us data and corroborative, corroborative, that's a hard one to say on a podcast, <laughs> evidence. But at the same time, I do truly feel, and T would probably smack me maybe, but, uh, this also kind of a, there's also a certain mysticism that we bake into these tools right? yes. that they become these, these divining objects to enable us to more readily be able to connect with whatever is on the other yeah. side. I would say that throughout history, humans, their major improvement on anything that came before was use of tools. Mm -hmm. So I feel like there is a lot that humans put into tools, a lot of their own energy a lot of their yeah. own intention so that, that it makes perfect sense it doesn't matter whether you're using a you know a, a craftsman using a chisel for 20 years and having a particular attachment to that yeah. chisel then you sort of starting working on the REM pod and getting used to it and it getting you know being imbued by your energy that's yeah. to me that's kind of the same same thing yeah so I, I think it's but I also think that a lot of the good stuff also comes from you, from your aura, like your yeah. openness of sort of things. Yeah. And, you know, humans have also many millennia of history is all about talking to the dead, talking to the oh, ancestral yeah. spirits. Yes. So that's, that's not weird at all to me. <laughs> no, no, no. So we've been on this journey, all of us together now going on, you know, about a year. Really, I think our first investigation kind of as a, as a group was in July of last year, July of last yeah. year. I think it was the first time we all went up to Gettysburg together. The orphanage. Yep. And yeah. so in, in this, in this time, actually, no, it was the first, the one that we went to uh, Eisenhower bridge for the first oh, time. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Yes, yes, yep, yes. That was the first oh my one. Gosh. This is kind of a big question, but I like to throw it out there, uh, 
how how has this impacted your life experience your human experience has this changed things for you have have you had personal growth what has this brought to your life is it weird to say comfort not at all <laughs> it, it it has i mean some of the things that like when my grandmother passed away some of the things that she was saying you know back then i was like oh she's probably just hallucinating or you know whatever you know she, but also I didn't know she was going to die two days later. Right. So yeah. um, to me that's it's comforting in, in some respects because I've always kind of had in the back of my mind like this can't be all there is. Right. Um, yeah. Your brain is actually creating the reality. Is that, you know, like get into the Matrix X yeah. kind of yeah. thing. Yeah. You are creating the reality. Uh, this is your brain's interpretation of reality. So is there another reality that your brain needs to be attuned to right. mm. that uh, can offer different explanations for that? Right. So it is sort of comforting. I have loved um, thinking about Ruth and knowing that she's around yeah. is deeply wonderful to me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because I was very – when she died, I was just – devastated yeah, she course. was just she was the peg that held the whole family together yeah. and so the idea that she's sort of around keeping an eye on people you know interrupting things if they try and come in the house and like no nope. i love that <laughs> <laughs> i do love that so yeah yeah it's actually been um i, d I don't know why I can understand that if something traumatic has happened to somebody when they're looking at the supernatural, why that could affect them. Yeah. But it hasn't uh, it hasn't upset me. It has only brought me comfort and interest. Yeah. And uh, as a person who loves history so much, the fact that history can talk back to you, that's kind of cool. That's pretty damn cool. Yeah. And just the opportunity. I mean, I feel like our, you know, the friendship of the four of us and our bond has evolved in such a amazing way yeah. through this has just been incredible. Yeah. And I think that that might actually attract more energy, you know? Uh, yeah. Um, I think that that warmth of that personal bond between the four of us um, is, is it going to be weird if it says it glows? I feel like, no. It would be if you're in a dark place and you and you're a sort of a, a an entity that hasn't had that. Maybe that's why we've been getting so many uh, amazing results. Because yeah. every time we go out, I don't think there's been time, uh, any time we haven't found something. Something, yeah, it's amazing. It's been such a journey. All right, Pip, it's that time of the show where I ask the don't turn around question as you've heard me ask others and and now it's your turn so i'm just going to i'm just going to let it fly are you ready mhm mm pip philippa do you turn around yes i do apparently i do because i might find a friend or a loved one right there and i've actually witnessed you in the act of turning around <laughs> <laughs> Well, Pip, this has been so lovely to have you on the show. We will definitely uh, we'll do this again. I think it would be also fun to do an episode with the four of us as oh, a group. Yeah. I think that would just be ridiculous. I think you and Tina would take over the show, <laughs> but that's okay. That's okay. You guys are very entertaining together. <laughs> so uh, please tell my listeners where to find out about all of the incredible stuff that you're doing in the writing world. Oh, uh, well, uh, pjballantine.com is my website. Um, I just released a uh, novel that's set in the Aliens universe. It is not fan fiction. It is officially licensed. Um, not many ghosts in it, but plenty of scares. Uh, and then you can always find me on Twitter. I, I'm Philippa Jane there. Weirdly, I've been there so long. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I think I could have just put... Pip, and it probably yeah. would have been fine. Yeah. Um, and on the, on the TikToks, uh, and also, of course, I'm, I, I recorded a brief one for Old Spirits on TikToks as well because we were talking about something, and he was like, you need to talk about that. Oh, brilliant, so. brilliant. Yeah, that's, I got to say, 
our fantastic TikTok is pretty much fully managed <laughs> by Pip, and she does a great a great job. So oh, we we, a, we appreciate all the effort you put there. <laughs> You're busting you into the end of our Phil? interview. Get up to the interview. Are you cheating on me, Phil? Yeah. I love yeah. of you. Oh, hi. <laughs> okay. Hi. So we'll be cutting all of this out. <laughs> Just kidding. Pip and T, <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for joining. And uh, I, I look forward to all of our continued adventures. Yes, me too. Don't know what what really causes this phenomenon. So it's been going on for a very long time, but every time.